our last panel is uh, related to some of what Scott just presented. You know, what are the lessons of the past decade's wars hold for the future? Uh, the moderator is going to be Audrey Kath Cronin, who is the director of the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Strategy, also the author of Power to the People, How Open Technological Innovation is Arming Tomorrow's, Terrors, Tomorrow's Terrorism. Well, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's a great honor to be talking to Sir Lawrence Friedman. There is no better known or more insightful Western strategist, policy advisor, commentator on international history, strategy, and nuclear theory, as well as current conflicts, than Sir Lawrence Friedman. Um, he was professor of war studies from 1982 to 2014 and vice principal of King's College London from 2003 to 2013. And his books, which are a subset of the total number of books, but the ones that relate most directly to what we're going to be talking about include Strategy of History, Command, The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine, and The Future of War, which is the topic of today's uh, conversation. Um, our task is to discuss the lessons of the past decade for wars of the future. So look at what has happened in the last 10 years and then look forward um, and so that's a huge undertaking. We could range across the whole world. We could talk about Afghanistan. We could talk about Myanmar. But let's get out of our US-centric focus and start with Sudan. Is there anything we can learn about the future of war by starting with the civil war in Sudan, Laurie? Yes. Um, I'm pleased you asked me that question, Audrey. <laughs> um, I think. Sudan tells us more about the future of war than most other conflicts going on at the moment. Um, it gets distressingly little attention. It's one of the most deadly conflicts going on at the moment. Um, it, in, first, it fits a pattern of wars. It's not the first war of its type in Africa, sadly. Wars of its, not even in Sudan. Uh, Ever since independence in 56, there's been lots of wars in Sudan, many of them deadly, um, very deadly. Uh, it's very difficult to know exactly whose side you're on. Um, both sides are committing war crimes. Um, uh, both sides are using uh, civilians effectively as hostages, not in the way that's been discussed before. Um, in accepting the logic of famine in some cases. Um, and there's different power plays going on. Um, so I'm particularly interested there in the role of the UAE. Uh, the UAE is supporting so-called rapid support force, which is essentially the Sudanese equivalent of the Wagner Group. Um, and um, with its reasons. Uh, but the UAE is then saying to us, you know, you want us to support you. Don't you start criticizing us about what we're doing in Sudan, though there are grounds for us doing so. So it's an indication of the shifts in the balance of power. Um, it's a war in which the major powers don't quite know what to do. Um, you know, for all the talk about China's role in Africa, it's pretty absent from many discussions. Russia has tried to play both sides. It's not quite sure which one it wants to support. Um, the U.S. tries to mediate, um, but it doesn't have the clout to do so. Um, and the Saudis are also dithering. So that seems to me as representative of contemporary conflict as the war in Ukraine, which is something that we can understand because the way in which it's being fought, the weapons with which it's being taught, fought, the fact that we know who we support um, is a much easier war to engage with and understand, uh, in a sense, the logic of what's going on. It's, it, it's much more military-centric. Mm. Um, but you know, the, the point about what's going on in Sudan, there are aircraft and drones and tanks involved, they're not in great numbers, but it reminds us of the politics that always has to be kept into a into account. Mm. So aren't you really saying that the future of war is um, looking a lot like the past 
It tends to. I mean, always the best predictor of where a war is likely to bring it, to break out, is where it's happened before. Um, you know, sadly, there are some... So if you, you know, ask, what are the lessons of Gaza? Um, what does that tell us about the future? It tells us about the future of Israel's wars. Um, and there are likely to be more war. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell us about the future of wars elsewhere. Um, Ukraine's interesting because um, it is, to some extent, not uh, a discontinuity. Uh, I mean, you can see things in, in the Baltics, but nothing quite at this scale and in this way. So we focus on that because we haven't seen regular forces employed with, re with the best regular weapons, or more or less the best, uh, for some time. So in that sense, uh, we, it, it fits our preconceptions about what war is about. Um, but by and large, the past is a pretty good guide to where wars will occur and what form they'll take. And that's certainly true in Africa, but also generally in the Middle East. Mm. So the big wars of recent times, you know, uh, Syria, so it's a war. There's, you can read across, uh, geographically it's not very far away, you can read across from one to the other, uh, um, but with you know, the singularities of every, of every conflict. Mm. So I think this audience would be very disappointed if I didn't ask you what you thought about the incursion into uh, the Kursk Oblast. What, what do you think about um, what is happening uh, with respect to Ukrainian strategy, and is there any logic that you see that can succeed? Um, there's two questions. I mean, I think there's, a, there's an operational and tactical logic to what they did. Um, and there's a very good piece by Mike Kaufman and Rob Lee in the latest Foreign Affairs. Um, which it shows, I think, the difficulty of trying to come out one way or the other. Yeah. Partly because, you know, we, uh, however much you try to follow this war from a distance, you are at a distance. Um, and the Ukrainians are very good at talking about uh, what they're doing to the Russians, less good at talking about what the Russians are doing to them. And what, when the Russians describe what they're doing to the Ukrainians, it's normally ludicrous in terms of the claims they're making. So it, it, to some extent, it's quite hard. But I think we can basically see that there's a lot of pressure on Ukraine. Morale had taken a bit of a battering. Uh, the country had taken a considerable battering. Um, and they weren't doing badly. I mean, I think it, you know, given um, the, the first months of this year, they weren't getting the, the, what they were expecting from the states. And what we were, uh, Europe was slow, and what, as we were hear, hearing earlier. Um, it's still pretty slow coming through. Um, I don't think many people thought by now the Russians would have made an awful lot more progress than they had made. I mean, it's, it's, it's inching forward, grueling stuff. Um, but I think for the Ukrainian people, just taking it and not giving it back was quite hard. I mean, they're giving it back in terms of attacking fuel dumps or pushing the Black Sea fleet out or hitting... Um, hitting Crimea, uh, but this was quite a dramatic move. And it showed that they had some operational competence mm. that, frankly, I think people doubted after last year's counteroffensive, um, which I think, you know, I, th I think the Ukrainians worked out pretty quickly that it wasn't going as well as they wanted. So it wasn't as catastrophic somehow as, as it's, it's presented, but it was certainly disappointing in terms of the expectations that had been built up. So to demonstrate that they could do something like this successfully, and still there, I mean, you know, there's talk of a Russian counterattack coming, it has to come at some point, uh, whatever Putin tries to play, however much he tries to play it down. But it's not easy for, for the Russians, because um, the Ukrainians, um, in this case, are the ones who have to be pushed out rather than the ones doing the pushing. Um, the risk, obviously, is what's happening in Donetsk. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is the balance. So there's two different campaigns going on at the same time. Again, I, one hesitates to be very definite about this, but the evidence at the moment is, again, the Russians are showing signs of, of stalling and exhaustion, but they're attacking in all sorts of places. It's, it's not... Um, the, 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 the Russians have not really stopped attacking at all throughout the whole war. They're, they're all continually throwing people at it. And when you think how little they've achieved, really, 
after the first months of the war, it's quite remarkable what, how little this effort has gained them. Uh, but they carry on doing it. And uh, you know, the consequence of that is the areas they're trying to quote unquote liberate is, is ruined. I mean, there's a number of Ukrainian towns and, uh, and villages that, that have been almost obliterated. Uh, the areas are depopulated, um, full of, uh, of old ordnance. Um, I mean, exactly what the Russians think they're doing is, uh, is problematic, apart from the sort of Putin's belief that somehow he can, um, if he can just hold this country, this, the, the, this, this territory, take more, um, at some point the Ukrainians have to give up. I don't think they will. But I, now, the next question is, can you turn this into a theory of victory? Much harder. That was my next question. Me, no. I, <laughs> the next question. Um, and I think the problem with that is what I think people find difficult to understand with a lot of contemporary warfare um, is that it, you, you can be losing or you cannot be winning without quite losing, um, which is not the same as talking about a stalemate or deadlock because, again, as was mentioned earlier, there's quite a lot of activity going on and there's a, a move to military advantage. But we still have in our heads the idea of war as being about battles which lead to decisive victories. Mm. And I think a lot of, you know, we've heard it here today, when you ask, well, what should we do? We, we need a theory of victory for Ukraine. It's very difficult to develop a theory of victory for Ukraine. It's very difficult to develop a theory of victory for Russia. Um, because, you know, what we've seen is how difficult it is to mount offensives uh, that cause that sort of breakthrough uh, that lead to a complete, that, that, that lead to the collapse um, of, um, of the enemy. The, the, the successful offensives, including the latest Kursk one, uh, have had an element of surprise and pretty thin defenses. Mm -hmm. uh, this was true in the first weeks of the war when the, when the Russians did make progress. It was true of the Kharkiv offensive uh, in September 2022, um, and it clearly wasn't true of the, of the offensive of last summer. It hasn't been true of most of the Russian offensives. I mean, uh, and even the, Kar the, the Kharkiv one they tried when, when they um, tried to move in wasn't that successful. So it's quite hard. So you know, again, once you, I mean, everybody who starts a war believes it's going to be quick, um, and that was certainly. Uh, again, as we heard earlier, was, Pu was Putin's intention. Um, and he might have got away with it, but he didn't. Uh, and that once he didn't get away with it and have a long war, um, then long wars have their own much slower, more difficult, attritional dynamics. And it stops not because of a battlefield defeat, necessarily, it can happen, um, but because of futility. One side says, this just isn't worth it anymore. Uh, or the costs, are, uh, there's no gain that we can see coming. And I think that's a Russian, still a Russian decision more than a, a Ukrainian decision. But to say that doesn't mean to say it's an imminent decision, um, or we will even know it's coming when it comes, because our sense of what's going on in the Kremlin is still um, pretty opaque. Well, but I think the focus in the United States is so heavily on the technologies that are being used in Ukraine. <laughs> So we have to shift to the technological dimension, even though I'm sure you're not going to think that's as decisive as most Americans seem to think it is. But in any case, Ukraine's been called a laboratory for the wars of the future. And General Milley um, and former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, just wrote a big piece mm -hmm. arguing that the technologies that are being used in Ukraine show what future war will be like. So they're looking at different types of robotics and unmanned aerial vehicles and taking out tanks and all of that dynamic, but also some people argue that the most important lesson from Ukraine is the electronic jamming of each side, or perhaps the most important lesson is the availability of satellites that have kept the Ukrainians on, uh, online. Or maybe the most important lesson is uh, that the Ukrainians were very well trained mm. in, in terms of being um, technologically savvy, and therefore they've been able to be very innovative, and otherwise there would be no Ukraine today. Does any of that resonate with yeah, you? Sure. What do you think? Of course. Um, 
So the first thing to note is that, again, going back to the short war, long war problem. Yeah. Um, when you start a war, you fight it with what you have. Um, the innovation comes later. So if you call, drones were really important in February 2022, but not the drones that are important now. Uh, or no. the, the developments that have taken place in drone technology, uh, both sides, but particularly on the Ukrainian side, have been extraordinary. And instead of you know, still relatively expensive, cheaper than aircraft, but still relatively expensive drones um, with which it started, it's, it's all about cheap, expendable, but really quite capable drones taking over now. Um, and I'm sure that will influence future war. Uh, you can see it in Gaza, you can see it even in Sudan, yeah. because it's cheap, it's easy to do. Um, you could, to be, you know, frankly, you could see it in Syria as well before uh, Ukraine. Uh, I mean, it was pretty crude then, sort of balancing grenades on commercial drones. Um, yeah. But it happened. So um, that'll, that'll no, if, if the next war turns into a long war, then there'll be other innovations that uh, uh, will be far more, maybe more important. The electronic warfare, I mean, it's a, that's a continuation. I mean, there's been a dual, um, I mean, go back to the Battle of Britain. Yeah. Um, you've got radar, um, you, You've got the doubting system of trying to anticipate where the attack's coming so you can concentrate. So, you know, each... You got human you, spotters. Who they had human spotters, yeah. uh, but they had radar. Yeah. That may, uh, and, ra you know, radar, there were humans at the end of that. Well, you know, Iron Dome, all of this is... Go it's the same thing's going on, but it's going on um, with, with humans not that in involved because there just isn't time. Um, so there's a continuity there. And electronic warfare um, clearly has been... Again, important as an answer to drones, with those latest drones trying to find ways around electronic warfare and so on. Um, so it's a duel, and that's continual. And your ability to manage that duel is quite important. And you've got, you know, again, when people look back at this war, they'll see um, two different systems uh, of innovation, a, sort of, um, a pretty dedicated and cumbersome, but cumbersome. Russian system, which doesn't necessarily get things to the front, and a sort of series of cottage industries in Ukraine that has produced extraordinary innovations in some, in, in some areas, but also means the you know, different units of the Ukrainian army have different types of drones, because yeah. they, so they've got their own suppliers and so on, uh, which can produce its own problems. Um, so the, 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 the innovation here is important. You also have to keep in mind that looking back again to the expectations of February 22, and certainly to any war in which the US will be involved, it's surprising how small a role air power has played. I mean, it does play a role, um, and that's obviously what a lot of the debate is about with air bases and being able to attack them and so on. Um, but the assumption, uh, you know, I've called many debates on this in uh, in the first part of 2022 about what a war might look like is that this would be the key to a Russian success. Mm -hmm. um, and it might have been if, if the Ukrainians haven't moved aircraft away from uh, some of the airfields pretty sharply just before the start of the war, uh, but they did. Um, so there's still a Ukrainian Air Force, and I've got some, a few F-16s, uh, and we'll get more. But air power has... I mean, in, in, in a war involving the United States, you would expect air power with men in the, and women in the, comp, in the cockpit to play a much more important role. Um, and that's why, again, another reason why you have to, one always has to be careful. You have to think about um, the range of capabilities that are available and the nature of the terrain and um, all sorts of factors that, that make it... Uh, make a difference. But I can't imagine an army in the future going to war without drones of the sort that we've seen, because they just make sense. And, uh, it's not that this wasn't anticipated beforehand about how drones might be used. Just a final factor, though, just to keep in mind, an awful lot um, of the war is still being fought with artillery, uh, of a pretty standard, in some cases, pretty vintage nature. 
um, and in trenches. Um, and it's still in the end, depending on you know, brave people holding their lines. Um, and often very vicious close-up fighting that our great-grandparents might have recognized. So with, you know, I was think about wars as having uh, layers, the, the, the historical layers, you know, the, the infantry, the artillery, the armor, um, the air, uh, now the, the autonomous vehicles and so on. The old bits don't go away. Mm. Um, and it's the interaction between the old and the new that gives wars their character. But what about the replacement of human beings with unmanned systems? Is that a broader strategic trend? I mean, after all, the, the Ukrainians are getting ready to uh, put a lot more robots, uh, ground-based robots on, on the battlefield in order to save their manpower. I mean, the three to one at least out, out manned by the Russians. Is that a broader future trend? Yeah, it must be. I mean, if, if you can, um, you know, again, you can see the logic of it starting with um, IEDs. If you if it better to send a, a robot yeah. over to go and uh, deal with, with a roadside bomb than a human. Um, and uh, you follow on from there, I mean, especially as, as the systems become cheaper. But there's limits. I mean, there's, there's, um, uh, you know, I think armies, armies of robots charging into battle with each other seems to be utterly pointless, really, um, uh, no. because you've still got to be able to know what you're doing when you get there, hold territory. You know, you, you know, specialized robots come in to dig the trenches and so on. So I think you'll see more of it, um, but in the end, you know, war is a very human activity, and it's about things. I think again, one of the problems about the way we talk about war and talk about the future of war is we look at uh, force on force. We, we look at as a duel without thinking about why is it being fought? Um, what's, you know, what are the objectives? How will they know when they've been achieved, if they can be achieved? Um, but it's about people. I mean, it's, it's about uh, who, who governs. It's about sovereign territory. It's about um, protecting people, uh, managing social divisions. Uh, so you're never going to, uh, even if you're going to get robots to do some of the work for you, um, there's limits to what a robot can do. Mm. Well, what about targeting? So let's shift for a second to, um, to Gaza, uh, which is in many respects a very old-fashioned mm. Uh, I mean, we've got urban warfare, we've got tunnels. That goes back to at least the ninth century, if not to biblical times. Uh, you know, there's so much that's very historic in that, um, you know, Israel-Gaza war. But at the same time, we also have very fast machine learning driven uh, systems like Lavender and the Gospel that are providing 100 targets per day when you used to get 100 targets per year. And I may have the figures wrong, but the, the pace and the, the speed at which targets are presented, and at least according to the reporting, I mean, I read this in the, in the reporting just as everyone else does, humans have 20 seconds to decide on a target. Yeah. And there's a huge pressure to get more targets. So when it comes to what the Israelis are doing in Gaza, is it possible that the technology is driving the strategy there well, I think you could see that, I mean, even before Gaza, you could see that issue in Iraq and Afghanistan or the whole drone warfare. Yeah. I mean, we look at the way people talked about drone warfare in Obama's administration. Uh, it was about targeted killings in ungoverned spaces yeah. and, and all that sort of thing, where exactly these sort of issues of, uh, are you sure? Uh, um, uh, you know, what happens if a child suddenly wanders into view and, and all these sorts of things. Um, and we know about you know, the mistakes that, that were made then. So one thing you can be pretty sure of is the mistakes are made. And, you know, you, you can get into the whole um, trauma and psychology of, uh, of behind the, the Israeli campaign. Um, but it, it's a question of uh, how bothered you are about, um, about the, whether you're making mistakes or not, um, if you think that in the end you're gonna get the really important people. 
I'm not sure many countries could do what I mean because you know you're talking about a situation which Israel has been tracking for all these characters for a long time. Well, they have a big database. They have, they have the database. Mm. So imagine China doing you know, what database. But um, I'm not sure many other countries would be in the position to fight those sort, that sort of war in that sort of way, because you know, you know this is uh, a small country fighting an even smaller entity within that small country. Um, well, it's, you know, they sort of know each other. Um, uh, and I think that, 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 makes it, that makes it different than um, uh, would be the case in, a, in another sort of counterinsurgency campaign. But the issue will always be there. Um, and, you know, all the sort of legal and ethical issues that, that rushed to the fore during the Obama administration, I think, you know, when Obama was probably relieved to find there was something he could do that could make him look tough without actually having to intervene directly, um, and suddenly realized that, that uh, this actually wasn't a good look at times because uh, uh, you weren't actually, in some cases you may have got the right people, it's certainly better than uh, using drones carefully when you could loiter and have a look than just blasting places with with bombs, um, but uh, whether you're actually progressing the conflict was a different question. Well, there is a big difference, right? Because the degree of casualties that resulted from drone attacks during the Obama administration yeah. and thereafter yeah, was, was deliberately kept down. quite low. Yeah. And the war in Gaza is um, a different thing altogether. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, well, so do you think that the fact that we have so many journalists who are able to cover the war in Ukraine uh, on the ground mm. um, is at, in contrast to the very few number of journalists we have on the ground in Gaza. Do you think that's making a strategic difference in the two wars? Because of course, anytime you have a terrorist group or, or even an insurgent group, however you wanna call Hamas at the moment, the, that third side, that psychological side is gonna be very important. So do you think that the fact that we can't keep journalists on the ground is making a difference in how that war is, is unfolding. It must be in some respect. I mean, it's, it's obviously a very dangerous place to try to report from. A lot of journalists have been killed. Um, and it means, you, you, you know, who delivers the information. Uh, yeah. uh, so you have all these issues about uh, the Hamas controls of the health service, which, is, which are issues. And the, 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 um, as Israelis are very quick to point out, you really, they never show a picture of a dead Hamas militant, yet we know such people that that's happened. So it, there is um, this question. I'm, I'm not sure in the end. I mean, I think um, the humanitarian tragedy in Gaza is very real. Yes. There are enough people are reporting out of there, um, uh, whatever their sympathies are. The, 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 the tragedies um, are happening on a, on a regular basis. And uh, that is part of the way the issue is treated. And, and whether you think right or wrong, certainly if you're living in Europe or the UK at the moment, you know pretty well that Israel's lost the information war. Um, I mean, it, Hamas occasionally reminds people, uh, or, or Israel's able to remind people of why the war started in the first place. But the fact is that, that um, Israel's lost the argument, um, and it isn't just you know it isn't just because of the manipulation of images. It's because Israel does not have a, has not provided a convincing answer as to how this will end. Um, and you know we were again hearing earlier about this tension between um, the, the so-called objective of eliminating Hamas which, you know, good luck with that, and um, getting out the hostages, uh, which is a divisive issue within Israel, I and mean, an intensely divisive issue within Israel, and all these arguments about what uh, Netanyahu's main objectives are. I mean, my criticism, which isn't new, of Israel's strategy is it completely lacks a political element. Mm. Uh, so it's not just a question of winning or losing the information war. It's a question of whether or not you know what's going to happen to Gaza. And if you have got no plan for the aftermath in Gaza, and again, this is a matter of 
not only just debate within Israel, debate within the Israeli cabinet uh, with no clear resolution, um, then you, you're, you're, you've got no way of bringing it to a conclusion. And, you know, has, uh, first Hamas turns into a guerrilla army, it goes more underground, but it's not going to go away completely. Um, and then you've still got the risks of the Hezbollah and the Houthis and, and so on. So that, I think, is the core, the, you know, the problem is a humanitarian one uh, in terms of how it represents itself to us, how we'd like to, why we, you know, people are anxious for a ceasefire. But the fundamental problem is you have two entities that want to eliminate each other yeah. and can't. Um, that's the problem. Um, and uh, you know, Hamas, Iran, Hezbollah, they're, they're all deaf to Israel, but they can't kill Israel. Um, but equally, Israel you know, sets as an objective the elimination of Hamas, but it can't eliminate Hamas. Um, so there's, this doesn't matter if you've got the sort of deadlock that we had up to the 7th of October. Uh, but once you're into active fighting, it, it's absolutely crippling. But we've had this dimension to tie into the earlier panel that we had of hostages, the Israeli hostages, and in some cases, a, a few Americans as well. Mm. I mean, it's just heartbreaking what happened to those six yeah. that as the Israeli troops, apparently, what the, what the press reports, as they closed in, apparently mm. those, those folks were just killed at the last minute. They had lived to that point. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Why is it having so little effect on Israeli policy? Well, you, you, I mean, I can give you a couple of pretty cynical uh, uh, answers. Um, one, of, one of which, I mean, you could, and again, you could see these arguments when hostage families were trying to make their case to some members of the Israeli coalition, um, is that the needs of the state override the needs of the hostages. Um, uh, you know, the, the more cynical answer is, sadly, these were all of the peacemakers. This, these were not... Netanyahu's natural supporters uh, in the kibbutzim. Um, uh, but, you know, for uh, anybody who knows Israel, knows the importance of um, looking after, even you know, recovering the bodies of the dead, never mind recovering them alive. So this is quite a, a shift. Uh, again, you can see the anger on, on the Israeli streets. Um, if you're going to rely on rescuing hostages, that's always going to be a risk. And we can all think of other rescue situations, not involving Israel, I think, that have gone wrong uh, for the same reason. True, yeah. Uh, so the, the issue, and the one that, that the Israelis are wrestling with, is whether or not um, if you'd relaxed your demands, uh, you would have got these people out in a negotiation. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, the difficulty of having talked about this is, is Hamas has been pretty cynic, has been very cynical about what it's trying to do as well. So, you know, you, this is, as you can gather, this is one of the most difficult issues to talk about. Um, because, if, again, if you're in the European debates, you're into the genocide, apartheid, colonialism, series of arguments you say well you know it didn't quite happen like that that's the wrong history da, da, da. Um, and you're having to look back at where Hamas came from um, why uh, the right in Israel and Hamas had a sort of coincidence of interests uh, in both undermining the two-state idea which together they succeeded um, and uh, Hamas is not going to give up the idea that it's the power in, um, uh, in Gaza. So, uh, you know, I started off talking with Sudan about, you know, the way in which these conflicts are viewed by the protagonists is not the way that we necessarily see it. So when we're saying, you know, why not, why doesn't Israel agree to a ceasefire? You need two to make the ceasefire. Uh, and Hamas has not always been as, uh, uh, as uh, pulled out as uh, often as Israel. So you have two parties 
whose interests are not necessarily served by it. And that's not unusual. Neither Russia nor Ukraine is that keen on a ceasefire at the moment because they are happy with the way that would mean the war would end. Um, it's not unusual. Why, why there isn't in Sudan? It's not unusual. It's very hard to persuade uh, people who've invested a lot in fighting to stop when they haven't quite got what they want. Yes. Well, that's kind of the realist it's way to look at war, and I, it's rather depressing. I think we can take Sorry. one question, and I hope it's a positive one, <laughs> or, or perhaps we'll cluster a few together. Is that all right, yeah, Peter? Yeah. Peter, we'll start with you. Yeah. We, um, when we had this first conference, uh, the first time we had this conference, we had Stephen, Stephen Pinker speak. Yeah, I remember. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And um, I know you have views about his views. Uh, and we're all Americans, or many of us are Americans in this room, and we tend to think the arc of history bends towards justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're a military historian. What is your sort of theory of history? And we, we're talking about the future of warfare. Um, you've written a book called The Future of War. Uh, just tell us what your prognosis is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can we take some more questions? Easy. <laughs> Let's take two more, and then you can, you can have uh, some Roy time. Roy Gutman, former journalist, uh, head of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Uh, can you, is there a theory of victory for Ukraine? Uh, if so, how much does it rely on Western arms, especially U.S. arms? And do you think the U.S. is holding back too, too much? Hmm. And one more, please. Uh, back there uh, on, on the left, please. Um. So thank you for your words. Uh, thought a lot about it. Um, I wanted to come from you know a uniform perspective. You know you've had the opportunity to talk over your long career, observe a lot of how we in uniform have thought about how war is changing. Um, and if you could uh, kind of share your thoughts about your observations about how we have thought you know in uniform about how war has changed because. Uh, to me anyways, it sure seems like we seem to consistently make the same mistakes when we're thinking about the future of war. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, or if I'm wrong, which is okay, probably. A lot there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with P Peter's simple question. Um, so the book was called The Future of War, A History, yeah. and was about the way people had thought about the future of war and got it wrong, um, for good reasons, because you describe the future of war to make a political point. Um, if you do this, the things that I advocate, um, you will be better placed to win the next war. If you fail to do these things, or don't pay good enough attention to what the bad guys are doing, you will lose the next war. So that's why you know, most of the writing on the future of war um, is to make a point, going right back to H.G. Wells or whatever. Um, I don't have... You know, History doesn't have a point of view. Histories, historians have views, but not history. There isn't a right side of history. Um, history is just things that have happened, and historians try to make sense of them. Uh, so there are patterns and so on. Um, I know there was a, a discussion of uh, prediction before. Um, it was carefully phrased, but um, I was one who didn't think Putin would invade because I thought it was a stupid thing to do. And it was a stupid thing to do, but he still did it. And, you know, uh, and, uh, you know there would be the sort of first rule of intelligence assessment is the hardest thing to predict is stupidity. Because uh, you always assume your enemies are super rational uh, and are making these deliberate calculated choices, but sometimes they just act out of um, emotion and foolishness. Um, so uh, I think the, uh, and you don't know the impact of these wars on future decision making. Um, you know, we don't know how much Beijing is just being reminded of the pitfalls of, of a war um, that uh, may start out with uh, great plans being outlined by, uh, by the general staff don't quite turn out the way that you thought they were going to turn out. Um, so uh, the experience of war uh, 
uh, is educational, not just in how to fight them, but whether it's wise to fight them at all. Um, I think on Ukraine, um, two things. First, the theory of victory is in part hanging in there. Um, I don't, as I said before, I don't. I think if you make a theory of victory dependent on a military breakthrough, um, you may be disappointed. Uh, but I think you can develop a theory based on keeping up the pressure in every way you can on Russia, every way you can, economically, diplomatically, militarily, um, oil refineries, whatever. Um, there's, the, you know, there's the laws of wars which I would encourage people, everybody to respect, but other than that, go for it. Um, I think on the escalation point, I think it's incredibly unfortunate that we just got, made this issue so big um, the, um, what happened, I think, is naturally, when you get into a war involving Russia, you think about the very worst that could happen, yeah. no doubt, nuclear war, uh, and you work backwards. How might it be that the very worst could happen? And you can think about five different scenarios. I mean, say, these are the things that we must avoid, rather than ask, in the here and now, in the choices that we're actually posing to Putin, Will nuclear use make any sense at all? And if you have that view, you say, there's actually only, one, if you actually read what Putin has said, forget about Medvedev, because he's drunk all the time, but <laughs> look at what Putin has actually said consistently. What would, the real red line for Putin is NATO forces fighting side by side with Ukrainian forces. That's what, now even then I'm not sure that it would make any sense for him at all to think about nuclear use. But that is the red line he has emphasized at every point. So if the administration had just said at the start, this is a red, which you know they did because the no-fly zone was the first issue that came. This is the red line that we recognize. Um, and, we, and we will respect that. But within that, we're going to give Ukraine whatever support we can. And we're not going to sort of say, you know, to get into the position where you say, well, um, we, we, we don't actually think you need these weapons. Um, and by the way, we're worried that it'll cause nuclear war. You know, it, it, it's up to the Ukrainians can make these decisions. They, have, they know they've got scarce, scarce resources. I don't think if changing the, the uh, American sort of rules and allowing the Ukrainians to or even just use, use the British storm shadow is going to be war winning in itself, but it would help adds to the pressure. But we've now got to the position where this seems the biggest issue imaginable, rather than just one of a number of decisions that you might make. Um, and just a sort of just final point on that. I think it, it's unfortunate, and the Ukrainians are not wholly um, without blame on this, um, but you can sort of understand why, is that you need far better discussions between Kyiv uh, and its partners on what they need and why they need it. And if the Americans say, well, you know, um, the targets aren't there, and the Ukraine say, look, here are some targets, then fine, have a proper discussion about it rather than um, get mealy-mouthed about it. So I think, I think it's, it's become elevated into a bigger issue than it need be. Um, and in the end, I suspect the policy will change. And it'll make some difference, but not, you know, not necessarily as much as we would like. Final question on the, um, on the military. Um, I, think it, I think they're developed after Vietnam. Um, and my latest book, to some extent, deals with this. It's available, I hope, still out there. Um, uh, a view that... Um, the politicians can set the objectives of war and then they must leave it to the professionals to get on with how you fight it. And that was naive. Um, it, it was naive on the political side because they needed the military advice, but they, you know, then there was a tendency for them just to hide behind the military advice. But the military advice was there to be questioned. That was the whole point of being given military advice, is to say, is it good advice? You know, what, what happens if that, you know, you need the conversation. Um, 
it's naive to believe that when people are getting killed, um, when the wrong things are hit, that the politicians can suddenly can just say, well, you know, we leave it to the armed forces. They're going to get engaged. They're going to get involved. So I think my view is that by being quite rigid on the division of labor between the civilians and the military, the military didn't accept their political responsibilities, which is not, you know, not um, what the Soviets used to call Bonapartism. It's not, you know, it's encouraging the military to mount coups or, 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 or to set the terms, but just to accept that they're part of a conversation that has to go both ways, in which they both have different competencies, but they need to talk about it. And I think also, um, you know, there's always a tendency, which all militaries have, is to, desire, is to think about the war as you would like to fight it. Um, uh, and this, I think, was at its height in the 1990s with the you know, re revolution of military affairs, and some of which you will remember. Some of you are old enough to remember. Um, and um, it almost became a war without tears. You know, the, 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 everything got into the decision cycle of the enemy and speed and all that, and John Boyd and all that sort of stuff. A maneuver versus attrition and so on. Um, and it created expectations which I think were just unrealistic about how a war would actually turn out. And you could argue, going back to Ukraine, that was part of the problem with the offensive, counteroffensive last year, is that maneuver became elevated into this proper way of doing things, um, that with the right amount of ar army you could do. It's very difficult to do it, and especially when you don't have air power backing you. So that's where I, um, I think the military are learning from this. I think, you know, the, uh, I think conversations these days are, are much more measured and um, realistic about some of these things. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a point where, you know, the mere mention of attrition got American military officers sort of shuddering with horror. Uh, this is the, you know, the wrong way to do things. Well, all wars are attritional. It's just the nature of war. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Sir Lawrence Friedman. Thank you.